All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's um, Stop to be Canada national call. My name is Lee Rafey, and I'm a policy and advocacy officer at Results Canada, where my work focuses on advocacy related to tuberculosis. And within this role, I'm also a member of Stop to be Canada's secretariat team. So these calls continue to occur um, every couple months just to kind of remain connected with our colleagues working on TV across the country. So we hope that you find um, these calls informative and also feel that there's space where you can share your work and your thoughts and coordinate our efforts to end TV. So do feel free to use the chat function throughout the call. In terms of the agenda for today, we'll start with an introduction to today's topic, which is really about accountability and the development of Stop to Be Partnerships Deadly Divide Report. So we're really grateful to have Deliana Garcia on the call today to run us through this report that was published in 2020, kind of the rationale for developing it in the first place and some of the key findings that came out of it. Deliana is the Director of International Projects and Emerging Issues at Migrant Clinician Network in the US and is part of the developed country NGO delegation to the Stop TV Partnership Board. So in this capacity, she was actively involved in the development of the first Deadly Divide Report in 2020. Following Deliana's introduction, Dr. Robin Waite of the Stop TV Canada Steering Committee will facilitate an interactive focus group discussion to gauge your thoughts on how Canada is progressing against its commitments to TV elimination. And this intel gathered today will help inform the next iteration of the Deadly Divide Report that will be published in the spring of 2023. So thank you for joining us today and sharing your perspectives with us. Following the conversation, we'll also circulate an electronic survey where you can add additional comments and pass it along to your network um, to help us have a really comprehensive understanding of the perspectives of Canadian civil society regarding the country's uh, TV elimination efforts. But we really hope that today's um, discussion is is interactive and engaging. So do share your thoughts with us. Near the end of the call, I'll share a couple brief updates um, from Stop to Be Canada and we'll open up for any other business where you're free to share any relevant updates or work with this group. So um, let's get started. Deliana, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself and the topic of today's discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I was already introduced. My name is Eliana Garcia. I go by Del and I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in Austin, Texas, and I now get to represent the developed country NGOs on the Stop TB board, which has been um, a real interesting and eye-opening opportunity to see the conversation that goes on at a really different level than so many of us are engaged in at our local or even in our own national levels. And so what I think is really wonderful about this particular um, initiative that we're engaged in is that it was at a recent gathering of the three uh, civil society delegations to the board, the uh, developing country NGO, the affected community and the developed country NGOs, that there was a discussion about the need to update the deadly divide. And the deadly divide, the original deadly divide, came as a result of the first ever UN high level meeting for tuberculosis in 2018. And I think the fact that there had never been the ability or the success at putting forward tuberculosis as a singular issue to be taken up by the UN, um, it was really very exciting that that was going to happen. And so the committees, um, countries came, commitments were made, there were a number of actions that were to be taken. And in 2020, then the same groups that had been so engaged in trying to move this project forward wanted to reflect on how successful um, all of the work had been at, since the 2018 high level meeting. And so what you have is the, in the first deadly divide is just sort of a review by the affected communities and the developed and developing country NGO groups to say, based on what was the commitment, the declaration that came out of that high level meeting, how do we believe the intervening two years um, have met with any kind of success or uh, barriers? What is unfortunate is that 
This was issued right at the start of a real recognition of the pandemic. And so all of the things that had been um, gained might now be lost. And so we're really not sure. And we're really trying to gather more information, not only on uh, movement forward, but certainly then on any losses that have occurred. What happened with that initial deadly divide is that the communities and the, and the committees asked for there to be uh, six actions. And someone just put the link in the, in the chat for you so that you'd be able to pull it up. But it was they were trying to look at reaching all people through TB prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, making the TB response rights-based, equitable, stigma-free with communities at the center, accelerate the development of and access to essential new tools to NTB, invest the funds necessary to NTB, commit to accountability, multi-sectorality, and leadership on TB, and leverage COVID-19 as a strategic opportunity to NTB. So some of what will be um, important to reflect on is where we stand on those particular actions. But I think that there is really a desire to not limit that, that if you feel like there is another area of great concern, that that then gets to come forward. Because the idea here is that the uh, next iteration will be published in the spring of 2023 ahead of the, new, the next UN high level meeting, which is tentatively scheduled for September 19th through the 21st. So if that is indeed to, to occur, it would really be nice for the civil society community, affected communities and NGO delegations to have had a moment to, to collect their thoughts on what was a, a part of the initial declaration in 2018, what was achieved, what was lost, and really any new directions that we feel like we need moving forward. Um, I would you know, just ask you to look at the um, summary, the executive summary that was put forward for it, if that's an easier thing for you to do, because there are a number of points under each of the actions. Um, and so, you know, as you reflect on perhaps further comments that you will offer once Dr. Wade is finished with the, with the uh, focus group, or you have an opportunity to look at the survey where you're going to be given the, the link for the um, electronic submission, your thoughts on particularly some of the essential points to each of these action steps um, will be great for all of us to hear, because I think that there is truly a sincere desire to hear from as many people as possible. I think that there was um, initially some sentiment that uh, an insufficient number of people were reached when we developed the first deadly divide, even though I know there was every effort made to reach um, representatives from all groups, from all countries, all regions. Um, there's, you know, and it's impossible for everyone to be happy, but I think there was a real sense that some very important voices were left out. And so the effort now is to make sure that we, in every way possible, seek to hear from every voice out there who would like to comment. And that's really all I would say coming forward, Dr. Waite. I don't know if there's something else that you would like for me to add. No, that's perfect. And we really appreciate you being here, here Dell. And we look forward to engaging with you further in, in your role as de developed country NGO uh, delegate representative for us. So thanks so much for being with us today. Um, I know you have to drop off. So if you want to drop off, we'll let you know how it goes. And, and I can push forward with uh, facilitating a focus group discussion. Excellent. Good luck to you all. And thank you so much for being here. This is such an important bit of work that you're doing. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Dal. All right. So hello, everyone. Del gave a bit of a bit of an overview. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Robin Wheat. Um, I used to work at Results Canada. I'm, I'm no longer with Results Canada. I've uh, stepped off a bit of a cliff and I'm now working as an independent consultant. And one of the roles I've recently picked up is the regional lead um, to facilitate interview discussions, focus group discussions with uh, individuals working to eliminate, eliminate TB in high-income country context. So that's the, the role uh, I'm, I'm 
wearing today and why I'm facilitating this conversation. So I'm just going to share my screen. Most of today's call is going to be an interactive discussion with, with all of you. Um, so let's get to that. Here. Okay. So I did pop the link in the chat to the last deadly divide report. And I think it's really important to, to know why the title of the report became deadly divide. It was really because what the community found at that point of consultation with actors was that there was a real deadly divide between the commitments that were made at the 2018 high level meeting on TV and the realities um, being experienced on the ground. And it's a deadly divide because people are dying because of the lack of action towards these commitments that were made at this high level meeting. So this time around, um, we, we really wanna hold uh, those heads of states accountable and make sure that when you say you're gonna do something, you actually do it. And us as a community, that's part of our role is, is maintaining the pressure to make sure that our governments are accountable for, for their commitments. So that's one purpose of the Delhi Divide 2.0 is really to be an accountability toolkit coming from the affected community CSOs um, um, perspective. So today is a, is a focus group discussion, but there's also a, a survey that's being developed and that will be shared very widely. And we hope that in addition to what you share today, you'll go away and work with your colleagues in your organizations and context to fill out the survey as well. But it's, it's really to capture the voice of people affected by TB, civil society organizations and NGOs working with affected communities to create that community accountability report on the response to NTB today. And as Dell said, it's going to be presented ahead of the next UN high level meeting on TB, which is scheduled for 2023. So this is one way to have our voices heard to center the needs, priorities and recommendations of communities affected by TB and to make sure that your valuable experience and contribution is, is a part of the development of a really strong call to action from from this community point of view. So you're gonna be helping to shape the asks essentially that the uh, community presents at the next HLM. So we don't wanna just focus on challenges today. We also want to reflect on the achievements that have been made since the last high level meeting. So we're gonna have a rich conversation about actions taken, achievements, successes, challenges, and what our priority messages for the way forward might be. We're going to use Mentimeter to, to kind of start to stimulate our conversation. Um, so I'll share some, some Mentimeter links in a moment. And I must apologize, I've been sick all month. Um, so my brain isn't working as well as it usually does. And I'm a little congested and stuffy. So sorry for that. If I have to pause every now and then, it's because I'm losing my breath. OK. So. Dell did show the six areas for action that came out of the, the last deadly divide report. And I'm just throwing them up on screen right now so you can have a quick review of them. But the report that is written, and our friend Amrita Daftri um, at York University is the lead writer of the deadly divide 2.0 report. She'll end up structuring the report around these six buckets of areas of action that the community wants to see um, at the HLM. And just to say that last time around, high income countries weren't um, included in the consultation process. Well, we were in some degree, but not with like an explicit focused attention to including the experience in a high income country context. So this time around, this is the first time that they have a regional lead um, facilitating conversations and consultations in a high income country context. So that's exciting. This is the first time that, that our perspectives will be very explicitly included alongside our colleagues living in middle and low income country contexts. So I am going to figure out how to get Menti up and let's dive into a conversation. And um, here we go. Okay, so first, question. And I think, Lee, do you have the link to share? Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. I just put the link in the chat. So hopefully that works for everyone. Okay. So you should be able to just go to that link 
and type in a response to the question that we have up on screen right now. The question being to please share an achievement made in progress towards TB elimination by you or your organization since 2018. So we'll give you three minutes to do that. You can share more than once. When you share, it would be really great if you just left <laughs> at the end of your contribution, your name and organization, if you feel comfortable doing so. If you wanna stay anonymous, that's fine. But if you feel okay uh, putting your name and organization, just add that at the, the end. And you don't need to add a ton of copy. There's not a ton of space to add lots of information here. Just give the high level prompt and we'll pick up from those prompts and dig a little bit deeper in a discussion around achievements made. Okay, so three minutes and we should be able to see people's contributions start coming in once you hit submit. Okay, got one from Yusuf. So far, if everyone can try to do one, that would be amazing. Great, starting to come, come together, seeing some content there. Hmm. Great, give it one more minute. All right, is anyone else still working on something? Feel free to take over the mic or raise your hand. <laughs> okay, great. You can keep them coming. Now we're going to shift to digging a little bit deeper on some of the contributions that, are, that our colleagues have made. And the reason that we're gonna dig deeper is because for the report, We'd like to build out some case studies of the different achievements and work that is happening around the world. So one of these stories could become a case study in the Deadly Divide 2.0 report. Okay, so who added a contribution about the new Canadian TV standards? Can whoever added that speak a little bit more to what that achievement um, has been, how it happened, What's the next steps? What does it really mean uh, in terms of TB elimination efforts here in Canada? So that was me. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Rays. I'm one of the co-chairs of Stop TB Canada, but but my day job is um, I'm I'm the uh, public health physician leading the tuberculosis program at Toronto Public Health in the city of Toronto. Um, so 
So the new, new Canadian TB standards is, is kind of the, the updated national guidelines on TB care, prevention, treatment, contact follow-up, outbreak management, kind of the whole, the, the kit and caboodle of the, the nitty gritty of, of clinical and, and public health care. Um, so so the, the piece about, you know, improving access to updated TB treatment and, and tests and that kind of stuff, having national guidelines is, is pretty key to actually rolling that out in a concrete way. It says, okay, we need to have access to 3HP, which is a bit of a problem in Canada, but there it is in the national standards, um, things like that. I'm also super proud of two particular um, chapters in this version of the Canadian TB standards. One is what I think is a, a fantastic chapter around TB and Indigenous communities in Canada that was co-written by, by representatives from the main Indigenous organizations in Canada. So that, that piece about, you know, people affected by having a, a direct role into national guidelines, I think is, is, is a huge step forward. Um, the other chapter that I, I think is a fantastic kind of leap forward is a, a for the first time a chapter on um, TB program metrics and monitoring, which lays out kind of a basic minimal framework um, for TB programs across Canada. Um, so if surveillance, better, better, at least at the national level, better TB surveillance can intersect with program monitoring um, and actual like concrete goals, um, that would get us a long way to, you know, actually being able to measure progress toward TB elimination. So that's that piece. And also I'm super proud that it happened despite a COVID pandemic. Yes, it's a lot of work to pull this thing off, and and uh, it wasn't the best circumstances. So it was it was a really good project to get done. Congratulations to you and every single contributor of the the new Canadian uh, TB standards. That's that's amazing work to be proud of. Go, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. One other thing I really want to highlight, which uh, dovetails with the next point I had there, um, the uh, uh, this version of the Canadian TB standards has updated guidelines about, about when can people safely be come out of isolation when they're established on treatment. And that, that has a massive impact on people's quality of life um, for them and their family. So that's a, a massive step forward for what it's actually like to be in treatment for TB. If, you, if you're living in a, a country that has, you know, formal, relatively stringent uh, isolation requirements, which is certainly, that's certainly a developed country thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people in that bucket. Mm -hmm. So. Amazing. That sounds like something to definitely highlight as a achievement and success story as a case study in the in the upcoming report. So let's have a further conversation on that. And the last standards, when were they published? The ones before that? 2014. 2014. So quite a bit of a long gap. time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations to you and everyone who contributed. I hope they're being well used in, in TB programs in Canada. Okay, what about Nancy? Um, you spoke about your group of TB researchers in Calgary beginning to have regular meetings to support each other and share successes. How did that come about? What is that meaning for uh, your day-to-day -day work on TB elimination here in Canada? If you could take the mic and share more, that would be awesome. Sure, um, I, I probably don't have a lot to say about this because I can't take a, an iota of credit for it, but um, that we have, um, one of the 
a few of the two, we have two new uh, researchers in Calgary. One is actually focused on non-tuberculous mycobacteria, but the other one does kind of basic bench science TB research. Her name is Narjus Khan. And she, um, those two, uh, those two researchers have kind of come together and started regular meetings that involve a lot of the um, myself, and I'm a, my professional background is as a nurse, but I just finished a PhD focused on uh, qualitative research in TB. And then also the, thank you, um, uh, many of our TB physicians here in Calgary also engage in research. Um, so we have monthly meetings just to get together to um, like bounce new ideas off of each other and um, get feedback on these new ideas and, you know, give tips and ideas about where to apply for grants, things like that. Um, and I think that will help us help us to advance. You know, lots of other bigger cities have uh, TD research groups, but we don't have that in Calgary. So I think starting that is just a good way to move research forward. And then I think the more different centers doing, there's so, so many avenues to um, uh, use research to promote, to, to to contribute to the elimination of TB that I think um, the more centers that are organized uh, in doing TB research, the farther we can get with uh, uh, using research to eliminate TB. So um, I, I can't, like I said, I didn't, uh, I didn't organize us, so I can't take any credit for it, but I think it, it's a good start in us uh, using research more effectively in, here in Calgary. Thanks for sharing, Dr. Beddingfield. Um, <laughs> I know I, when people say Dr. White, I'm like, ooh, I forget that that's a thing. <laughs> Sometimes we walk I'm not quite used to it yet, but thank right? you. <laughs> love it. Own it. Love it. Um, yeah, communities of practice are, are really critically important. And I'll just point out that Robin Love, who's on the call, um, is with U Alberta and does some similar work. And then Lena, who's from McGill University as well. So there might even be some like cross university communities of practice that that could pop up through through connections made through Stop to Be Canada. Okay, let's do one more and then move on. Who added the uh, increase in awareness and building political champions for TB? That was me. Um, I put those two points kind of on behalf of Stop to Be Canada and Results Canada, just kind of emphasizing our work on more of the advocacy side. And um, I would say an achievement from both of those networks has been increasing awareness for TB and, and building political champions um, in, in, in Parliament. And one example, clear example, is through the Global Fund um, investment that Canada made about a month ago. So I think that that's something to be to be proud of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's already conversation about um, from a high income country perspective, looking at the, the Global Fund 7th replenishment as a specific case study. And uh, really interestingly, um, Canada, are, who holds the board seat on the Global Fund for Canada, Switzerland and Australia, really led um, the discussion around the disease split. So with any money over 12 billion from the seventh replenishment, now there's a disease split with 25% of all of the resources for 12 billion and above. And remember we got to 14.65 billion, we'll go to, to TB. So there's, there's, I mean, that's, that's a good thing, more resources for TB coming out of the seventh replenishment and Canada really leading on, on some of that disease split conversation. Um, and then also just on Stop to be Canada, like last time the deadly divide report was being developed, Stop to be Canada was just being developed. So we didn't have this network of actors engaged in TB elimination to tap into for a consultation like this. So the fact that Stop to be Canada exists and we're making these connections across our country and we're engaged in advocacy and awareness raising and um, supporting one another in and of itself, I'd say is a pretty big achievement to, to highlight since 2018. What about, um, what about other, Yusuf, I wanna to come to you for you to speak to yours. And then I wanna to move to some challenges. So start thinking about on the flip flop side of the achievement, what are some challenges that are remaining in, in the Canadian domestic context um, in ending 
TB here. So over to you, Yusuf, and then we'll we'll have a conversation about challenges and gaps. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, hi Robin. Ellie, nice to see you again. Um, so in terms of what we did, um, so we we were able to. So when I when we joined the team, um, we identified that there were a lot of missing TB cases, especially among children. They were almost always overlooked, and as um, when they visit, um, because of the the kind of state that we were operating in, it was a resource um, constrained setting, right? So people visit the local chemists and all that for for medications and treatment rather than visiting the hospital. So what we did was to engage with them and um, we were able to ramp up the numbers. We acted as a bridge between the children in their communities and the diagnostic centers and the um, specialists that would help us diagnose those TB um, cases. And with that, in Munye, we were able to achieve um, the success that we did and we replicated it as well. So that model was kind of adopted for the entire, um, for our organization countrywide, and it has achieved a lot of um, successes ever since. That's amazing, Yusuf. That's like, yeah, to see a pilot then be scaled because it had massive success is definitely an achievement to be really proud of. Um, if it's okay, I might connect you Thank with you. our co colleagues that are um, surveying and engaging communities um, in in Nigeria right now, so stop to be Nigeria is is supporting with that regional effort. Um, so if it's okay, I might connect you with with them if if you'd be willing to be interviewed or or give your perspective from from your time working at KNCB um, in Nigeria. Is that okay? Oh, that's whatever. okay, Robin. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, okay cool. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second to to look at some faces. If anybody has a camera on, nope. Um, <laughs> to see about challenges. So I don't have this question on a Mentimeter because you're only allowed two with a free account. Um, so any challenges that you want to highlight that are that are causing lack of speed or action towards TB elimination in, in Canada? So the flip side of achievements or any gaps that you want to highlight. Oh, Elizabeth has one, come on in. So, I mean, our, our biggest challenge locally in Toronto is still, we're ve still very much in, in sort of early recovery from, from COVID. Um, we're still only at something like 55, 55, 60% of staffing. Um, compared to you know, where, where we were before the COVID pandemic. Okay. Um, so there's still a lot of building back up basic infrastructure for TB care. Um, so that feels like the biggest thing. Um, and by the same token, there's, there's still a lot of uh, political attention to COVID and broader issues of COVID recovery. Um, that make it, you know, there's a lot of distractions for politicians when you're trying to say, but TV. So mm -hmm. uh, th that the context, I think, of, of where we're at right now is a is kind of a catch-all barrier in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And so that capacity hasn't, the pre-pandemic capacity hasn't fully come back yet. No. No. Okay. No. Not I don't I don't think it has on the like on the ground service delivery infrastructure side, and I don't think it has on the policy infrastructure side either. Okay, okay. I was going to share the Stop TB Canada report looking at the impact of COVID nineteen on TB programs. Here I was going to use that as a as secondary data essentially mm -hmm. to inform um, the Deadly Divide two point report. Uh, but maybe a little bit of a conversation on what's happened since that was published would be would be helpful to be to be up to date. <clears throat> so I might come back to you to, to just ask a few extra questions on that, Elizabeth, whenever Amrita starts writing. Um, not to put anyone on the spot, but I'm, I'm going to. Um, 
Tina or Robin Love, anything from your perspective in terms of what are persisting challenges or gaps that are impeding TB elimination efforts in Canada? Or Kelsey or Shauna, anyone? Carolyn, go ahead. Uh, I think for, for us, um, a big thing because we work uh, a lot on site in, in communities and we do a lot of organizing and, and larger events. Um, certainly the pandemic was just difficult to migrate over that communal aspect of bringing all levels of TB efforts together uh, in one physical space uh, was mm -hmm. really difficult during uh, the pandemic. So now we're kind of still in the hangover of that, but uh, we're kind of seeing our way through. But um, that did spur a little bit of innovation um, in terms of trying to share data. So, we, so um, sorry, I didn't add it before, but we've got like, we're working on a TV dashboard for the province of Alberta. Um, and that is born out of that frustration that we couldn't come together and talk about data. So yeah, one is begetting the other, so. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, people, people who take action when there's frustrations, that's, that's awesome. Looking forward to seeing the dashboard when it's live and seeing if uh, if maybe it could be replicated in other provinces too. <clears throat> Carolyn or, or, or Shauna or Kelsey or Pearl. Hi everyone, it's Caroline Newberry um, from the Northwest Territories. Uh, I mean, much of the same responses as everyone else um, post pandemic. Unfortunately for us, um, being such a small jurisdiction, um, prior to the pandemic, we were involved in um, a system transformation in which um, the health department uh, was taking away uh, public health positions and turning them into primary care positions. So we lost a lot of public health infrastructure in the Northwest Territories, which was a big to us. I work in the office of the chief public health officer uh, as a communicable disease, the manager of the communicable disease control unit. Um, so we lost a, lost a lot of frontline public health positions and then the pandemic hit. So silver lining to that, which are, there are very few, I think, was that um, the health department recognized and the government recognized that public health infrastructure was needed. <laughs> um, so we're still uh, trying to claw back public health positions to build up our public health infrastructure. Um, and so like many of the other comments, you know, we're still recovering from the pandemic in, in a systematic way and um, in a communicable disease way. Um, we've had, you know, not very many cases of TB. I'm gonna knock on wood, but we all know that's probably just uh, because of COVID. Um, and currently right now, all of our public health efforts are really focused on syphilis outbreak here in the NWT. I don't know if anybody's seen some national rates, but boy, are we winning in a really bad way. <laughs> so, so it's competing priorities for us as well. Um, I used to be the TV consultant for the NWT and still am somewhat. Um, so I continue to sort of carry that flag and hope that um, we'll be able to get back to uh, more TB programming. Programming. We are just revitalizing um, our TB chapter and our communicable disease control uh, manual and um, implementing the new LTBI frontline um, standards for treatment. So it's a lot of work for a very small office. There are literally um, two of us who work here <laughs> and the chief public health officer. So thank you for letting me comment. Well, thank you for for all the hard work. I, you know, if you're lacking in, in resource, human resource, it can be frustrating in a, in a struggle, but just know that that your work is recognized and appreciated by everyone on this call. Um, so thank you for that. And hopefully we can all work together to, to get those public health positions back so that you've, you've got more support to do your important work. Shada? I was just going to simply comment and echo uh, exactly what Carolyn was saying and Elizabeth. Um, I'm come from Eastern Ontario where we're a really small health unit and our efforts uh, 
and manpower had to be deployed, obviously, for the Corvus response. And now as part of recovery, we are kind of in a very strange land where we're continuing with response, but recovering at the same time. So, um, yeah, and as as Carolyn was saying, we, we don't have very high rates of TB in our area, but again, it's probably due to COVID and um, reduced testing, but um, we continue to do what we can do. Okay. Um, yes, Yusuf, seeing, seeing your, your comment, definitely. Public awareness raising about TB critically needs to happen. We've, we have stopped to be Canada. Again, we're kind of like two years into this this new model of, of engaging membership and engaging directly with parliamentarians. And we've had some conversations with parliamentarians who didn't even know what tuberculosis was. So, or that it was an issue and they were in a, in a representing a constituency where, where there was a significant TB affected community. So definitely that work needs to happen. Um, we're gonna share my screen one more time and go on to the next mentee question. So this next mentee question, I hope this works, Lee. Do I, how do I do this? Just give me one sec. Okay, here we go. Did that, did that just change on everyone else's side? Do you see this question in your link? Maybe we could reshare the link, Lee, and make sure it comes up to this. But this is the next question on mentee. And it's around, wanting to hear what your main recommendation is for national and global decision makers to address TB in the communities you work with. So this one, I'd say, um, try to be quite intentional with your language because I'll try to download this and we can share it. Perhaps they'll, they'll become standout quotes in the report. Um, not sure yet, but think with that in mind that it could become a quote within the report. If you don't want that, just let me know and we won't make that happen. But if you're okay with that, um, then pay attention to your language. And um, if you wanna leave your name and your organization, you can do that. If you wanna be anonymous and say just what your role is and what capacity you're engaged in the TB space, then you can do that too. So what, whatever whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, so I'll give you three minutes to, to do this. <laughs> and it is just confirming it's working. I won't say otherwise, so I assume so. Yay. All right, I see one comment so far. I hope you're all busy typing away to get more in. All right, who's still typing? Is 
Is anyone still typing? Feel free to just. Uh... Okay, I see it. Address social determinants of health. Full stop. From Caroline in the in the chat. Agree. We've got one that says an increased political will and a more coordinated effort to commit resources to the fight against TB. One that says don't just build back the old structures slash processes for TB post COVID. Go straight to building the TB systems we want to see in the future. Yes. And then from Yusuf, health workers, governments, politicians, policymakers, and everyone needs to consciously do more in terms of sparking up and sustaining conversations on and around TB if we are to make any further progress. It's our collective responsibility. And the last one, developed countries, COVID and monkeypox triggered widespread recognition of the social such financial hardships for people in isolation for communicable disease and mechanisms to assist establish those equity measures as permanent support for TB. I feel like that didn't get finished. Did that one not get finished? Etc. Like it's TB oh. for sure, but as a general principle. Establish those equity measures as permanent support for TB, et cetera. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. All right, thank you so much. So I'm just gonna stop sharing. I'll figure out how to download this later. Um, as I said at the start of the call, there is an online survey that Stop TB Partnership is going to start circulating to partners, asking them to complete. So whenever that comes through, you see it either through them or from Stop TV Canada, um, please do take the time to complete it. Um, the more information that we get from people engaged with TB elimination in high income countries like Canada, the more comprehensive picture we'll have as towards going into the next high level meeting on TB. So we wanna be able to share that story and we wanna be able to use that information to inform our calls to action in the lead up to that really important meeting. Um, so thank you so much for engaging today. I'm gonna hand it over to Lee to give a bit of an update on what Stop to Be Canada has been working on lately. And then also open the floor to an AOB to hear from anyone on this call that has anything that you wanna share with your colleagues. Um, we, we really want to make sure that Stop to Be Canada is a space for sharing and, and conversation. So please do leverage the networks and the contacts that you're making here. And, and if you have something to share or you want to get some information or feedback from others who are engaged in similar work in other provinces, tap into those people who are on that call here today. But first, over to Lee. Oh, uh, I think, uh, Lee, we can't quite hear you. I think she's having some computer issues. Okay. Um, she's on mute. And can't can't unmute. Can't unmute. She can just type in chat if she can't. Okay. If you want to type in chat. Um Elizabeth, do you want to give a bit of an update on, on some of the things that Stop to Be Canada's been up to? Um I can talk about one thing since it's it's sort of a current one, which is, uh, but I'm going to get the technical terms wrong, but basically comments on the federal budget plan. So, so uh, uh, we worked with um, uh, the Canadian Thoracic Society to uh, uh, put in a joint submission um uh uh to the federal budget comments and um and i'm going to depend on lee to to correct my technical language here um and also to uh oh my gosh there's there's a house blah, 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 thank you for the pre-budget consultations there we go that's the right term um but all, also to um there's a this committee on Gandhi committee on health or something like oh, that. that yeah, one? so we have a request for a meeting yeah. in yeah. with them. So we're hoping to get a response from them and then yeah. essentially be invited to show up as witnesses and, yes. and share share um, the state of TB elimination efforts in Canada 
within yeah. that that health committee space that's that's made up of parliamentarians who sit on that health committee. So that's something we've been doing. I think another thing to flag would be that we're also working, and this I think will be a case study in the Deadly Divide 2.0 that we look at, um, but lack of access to rifapantine here in Canada mm -hmm. um, is something that Stop to Be Canada is starting to, to work on. And we've sent a letter to Sanofi um, to ask that they license it for use here. So I'll put the letter that we sent mm -hmm. off in the chat if you wanna go, go read that, but we're gonna be, tacking this piece of work on to what is now termed the 146 times 24 campaign that is a global campaign launched by tag partners in health and msf to essentially call for rapid adoption of new treatments for mm -hmm. for tb because now for the first time in in more than 50 60 years we have shorter safer more effective treatments across mm -hmm. um all like TB, drug sensitive TB and drug resistant TB. So we wanna get those into the, the hands of communities as fast as possible. So here in Canada, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be running that campaign under Stop TB Canada and we'll be looking specifically at lack of access to rifapantine in the Canadian domestic context. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably like a good update as to what we've been, we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Check out our newsletters. We send those on a monthly basis. So that'll have all the latest and greatest. It'll also have ways for, for you to engage with, with the advocacy work we're doing. Um, and if you ever have any information or feedback for us, and there's a need that, that you see isn't being met by the Stop to Be Canada network that we can maybe fulfill, please reach out and let us know. We are currently not an organization. We are a network of volunteers, people who care about TB elimination at home and abroad, who are just rolling up their sleeves and putting in the work to 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 to, to make impact in the world. So if 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 you're if you're engaged, keep engaging. If you want to see more from us, let us know. If you want to support the work we're doing, let us know. We'll we'll take all the support that that we can get. It's a network and a community of people who care, taking action together. So with that. Anything from anyone here, any AOB that, that, that you want to share with your colleagues? AOB means any other business. Sorry, Lee, if, if Elizabeth and I didn't quite capture your updates, great. <laughs> we tried. Lurching along there. And just for people who haven't you know, like clicked on the links there, on that pre-budget submission on, on the stuff to the uh, Standing Committee on Health, I think I'm getting my technical terms back online, um, one of the biggest main asks that that um that we put on the table is the ongoing ask that we've been kind of hammering away on for a number of years now around national level surveillance for tb but kind of a step up from that in kind of scale for the federal government to to establish um a, a tb elimination coordinating group by whatever name um, so that the, the federal government and the provincial territorial governments are actually connecting to, to make things happen on the ground. Um, it's, it's not enough for the federal government to say, we're committed to TB elimination when they, they don't actually constitutionally provide TB prevention or care or programming to most people in Canada. Um, they absolutely have a critical essential role for in TB in indigenous communities. Um, but but there's a lot more people suffering from TB in Canada, um, and they depend absolutely on provincial territorial um, uh, programs for that prevention and care. So. Great, thanks. Anyone else have any updates? Robin or Petra, anything to share? Tina, Carl, Minerva. No. I can fill up a little more time to explain why I why I flagged that the de new, newer de-isolation policies. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so <laughs> people who get sick with TB like right now won't even realize the impact of that change. But the old criteria said you had to stop coughing out um, uh, sorry, you had to be smear negative. 
So when you look at your sputum under a microscope, there have to be no TB bacteria visible. And we've known for a long time that people can be coughing out dead bacteria that you can see on a smear for weeks, sometimes months. And if people have extensive tuberculosis, we've had people who've been stuck in isolation, despite the fact they were doing really well on treatment and had no symptoms at all whatsoever, stuck in isolation for as long as four or five months. Um, so that means unable to work, unable to go to school, unable to participate in social life, extended family life, and the, the financial and social impact on people is, is unbelievable when you're stuck in that situation. Um, and you can't, and you know, thinking about a situation that happens not uncommonly in Toronto where people might be a foreign student, diagnose a TB here, because they're still smear positive, they can't even get on a plane to go home, you know, to be, to, to, you know, be taken care of by their family while they're recovering from TB. Um, so, so updating the guidelines to, you know, current evidence about that you can safely get people out of isolation much sooner is it's not just kind of a technical update to the guidelines. It's a huge, huge impact on people's quality of life yeah, and their families, right? If you lose your, your primary income earner in a family for five months, that's, that's horrific. So that's why I'm yeah. so excited about it. It's not just the treatment part, it's the social determinants of health piece. Yeah. As well. so. That's amazing. That's amazing, Elizabeth. Really exciting to see those new standards and I hope they're being implemented in practice like already. Are they? Will it, will it lead to automatic action? So, so it kind of depends. If you have a provincial TB program that says we're starting now, then it would be rolling down. Um, if you're in a decentralized system like Ontario and Quebec, it can take a little trickle down and you know not just in pushes in a, in a while. Um, but again, like because it's in the Canadian TB standards, it you know that means there's something concrete for programs to point to, um, and clinicians and also patients who happen to look it up online and say, hey, this is I'm still in isolation. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, side thought, and then we'll end our call because we're out of time. Um, we should be linking some of the standards, the new standards to our, our 146 FEM24 campaigning in Canada, if, you know, and mm -hmm. like take on that role of like raising awareness that they exist and putting pressure on, on governments to, to implement them ASAP. Mm -hmm. Tina, did you have a hand? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I'm I'm like on a couple of days off right now, so I'm actually at a pool. <laughs> oh, but, nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just, you know, thinking about what Elizabeth was saying. Um, like our TV program in Saskatchewan is is run by the province, and then our organization works with the First Nations communities. So isolation is um is really hard. For some of our clients because we do they do have like a lot of overcrowding and then um like transient population too we find that when somebody's diagnosed with tb um you know they don't want anybody to know that they have tb and and we do struggle with that um the fact that they have to miss work and some people have actually lost their jobs and lost their they're funding the school because they weren't able to attend. Um, so I think, you know, it would be good if, if the government had some sort of way to assist clients with that everywhere, um, you know, to make up for that loss of income, um, just so families aren't, aren't worried and struggling because, you know, a TB diagnosis is already, you know, super hard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, you know, I always try and suggest that, but <clears throat> it'd be good if everybody was on the same page. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Social support, like money for people with a TB diagnosis, so they're not worried about that. There's no reason why that couldn't happen. Okay, we are at time. Yeah. So 
it's time to say goodbye. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for showing up today, for engaging and participating in the creation of the Deadly Divide 2.0 report. Um, we'll follow up with the survey link when it's when it's ready. And I might reach out to a few of you um, to pick your brain a little bit more if, if, if that's okay. But thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. Bye everyone. Bye. I'm sorry you can't talk, Lee. I wanted to have a chat. <laughs> okay, just um, let me know when the recording's on YouTube. Send me the link. Thanks so much for, for helping facilitate today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Yusuf. I'll try to feel better. It's been a month, I tell you. <laughs> okay, bye, Lee.